Acts 3, verses 1 to 12. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large, they are driven by fierce winds. They are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires." Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is also set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on the fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear frigs? Thus no spring yields both salt water, and fresh. Should we sing as our hymn of preparation? Song number 354. Let us stand. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. 
This morning I'll be reading a sermon that was written by Dr. Sinclair Ferguson. I wonder if you would think about yourself, or indeed if you would think that others would think this about you, that your people would call what a mature Christian. You've been a Christian five years, ten years, twenty years, forty years, some of you sixty years, even seventy years. But we all recognize, don't we, that maturity in Christian life is not a matter merely of age, and that's why it's one of James's concerns as he writes this little book. It looks as though to Christians who were once members of his congregation in Jerusalem, but are now dis- dispersed or scattered throughout the ancient world, and he's following up. He's wanting to encourage them to keep on going in the Christian life. And one of his greatest concerns is obviously that they're growing to be clearly mature Christians. In the first section of his letter, he had taught us how we grow to maturity through the way in which we respond to trials. And so in chapter 1, verse 4, he was anxious that steadfastness in the face of trials would bring us to perfect or mature and complete, rounded, balanced, growing Christians. So we grow to maturity through the way in which we respond to difficult providences in our lives, to tests and trials. But we grow to maturity also. James had been emphasizing in the way in which we respond to the word of God, like Abraham in chapter 2, verse 22. In his life, faith gave birth to obedience. You see that faith was active along with his works. The way he was willing to obey God and his faith was completed. His faith was brought to maturity through that obedience to the word of God. So we're brought to maturity by the way in which we respond to the providence of God, especially the more difficult providences of God. And we're brought to maturity by the way in which we respond to the word of God. We develop, we develop, mature Christians develop an instinct to say to the Lord as he speaks to them in his word, right away, Lord, that's just what I was thinking. I maybe should do myself. That glad, instinctive obedience to the Lord's word is a great mark of spiritual maturity. When your children stamp their feet and don't listen to you as their father, then you understand they haven't grown into a mature relationship with you. Now James is coming to develop this thought of what it means to be a mature Christian, and he says from this point onwards that a great mark of a mature Christian is that a mature Christian practices a consistent Christian life. A mature Christian practices a consistent Christian life. And it's fascinating that the first thing he speaks about in this section of this little book is the use that we make of our tongues. One of the clearest evidences that you have grown into maturity as a Christian is that you, that you have developed a certain mastery of the tongue. And he gets into discussing this by responding to what I take was a situation that may have arisen in these different churches to whom he was writing. Perhaps he had heard about it through mutual Christian friends. There seems to have been people in the church who were saying, why don't I get my tongue to be a teacher? I should be a teacher. They saw in whatever equivalent these early churches had of their church education. It was the same old people teaching those education classes. And they said, I should be the teacher. I need to have opportunity, they said. And James is saying to them, let me ask you a question. Do you also wish to be judged more strictly? I don't know what our elders ask when they supervise our education classes and recognize individuals to be teachers, but this would be a good question to ask, wouldn't it? Are you prepared to be judged more strictly? He's not just speaking about at the human level, although that's obviously true. Among ministers, people sometimes joke and say, you know, my congregation went home and they had roasted preacher for lunch or roasted teacher for lunch. The fact of the matter is that the most human level, if you teach, you will be judged more strictly. If I devoted my life to living in total silence, people might think I was strange, but they would never judge me as strictly as I've been judged throughout the course of my Christian life and service. But that's not just what he's thinking about. He's thinking about a far more careful assessment. He's thinking about God's judgment on my life. And so you see, he understands there are people who say, I want to be a teacher because people need to listen to me. 
And James is saying, aha, but the greatest you is, have you, re- but the greatest you is, have you really listened to God? Have you really listened to God in such a way that there are at least the beginnings in your life of a mastery of the tongue? Now, we need to understand that by mastery of the tongue, James does not mean the ability to hold your tongue. That's part of it. And some of us doubt this by upbringing, by dis- disposition, by culture. We need to learn to hold our tongues and to be silent. Even the proverb says, You know, if you can develop the ability to be silent in company, many people will think you're actually wise. And it's true. It really is true. If you develop the ability to be sanely quiet when people are talking about something, the day will come when they'll assume that you've got something very important to contribute to the discussion. But you see, when I open my mouth, all my folly may simply pour out. But he's speaking about far more than that. The mastery of the tongue is not simply the ability that some of us have by nature to say very little. The mastery of the tongue is best expressed not when we are silent, but when we speak. And when we speak, it becomes evident that there is much in our hearts of the grace of Jesus Christ that we're able to speak. I used to belong to a congregation where in another place, in another place where it was a simple part of life to greet people on Sunday morning and to shake hands. It's so good to see you. How are you doing? And sometimes I would hold on to that hand. And then I realized that's not what was expected. I realized if I said, actually, I'm not doing very well, I would be engaged in an arm arm wrestling match. Because how are you doing? Great to see you did not indicate that there was a largeness of God's grace in the heart. That you would be able to dispense spiritual medicine to someone who wasn't doing okay. You see, the real... The, the real evidence I've grown to spiritual maturity is in terms of what comes out of my mouth, that I have resources of God's truth and God's words in different situations when people are joyful or sorrowful, when people are in darkness and needing light, confused and needing wisdom. I'm like one of those ancient apothecaries who is able to go to those marvelous jars of truth, and there they are in Scripture, and I'm able to select just the right thing to say, just like my Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see that Jesus' teachings had rubbed off on James. You remember how this brother, the Lord Jesus, had said, Dear ones, it's out of the heart and it's abundance that the mouth speaks. And every time we speak, we actually reveal what's in our hearts. Remember these old-fashioned movies before the modern technology where if some news item burst upon the day, you would see the reporter screwing to the banks of telephones on the wall and putting their finger in the circle and dialing the number to, the, to New York, to the Times, to the Washington Post, or whatever, the, or whatever, and then the editor listening on the other side, and then the screen would kind of whirl before your eyes with newspapers flashing, and it was all the way in the old-fashioned technology. They were trying to communicate that the news was being spread everywhere. Dear ones, our tongues are the reporters of our hearts that spread everywhere we go what is in our hearts. And so you understand why James is saying mastery of the tongue is not just something to be reversed for those among you who teach. Mastery of the tongue is essential for anyone who would really grow as a Christian believer. It seems he would... He developed his thinking in three stages in the rest of this chapter. The man or woman who can master the tongue can master him or himself. And he says three things. One, he points out, he, he, points out, he underlines the disproportionate power of the tongue. You see in verse 3 and 4, he uses two simple illustrations. The bit in the horse's mouth, the rudder on the back of a great ship. He hadn't seen the movie Ben-Hur, but he'd seen races He'd seen people on these powerful animals, sometimes more than one horse and a chariot. He'd seen these men holding on and guiding these powerful horses. One, two, three, four, sometimes more. How did they do it? By a little piece of steel that was put in their mouths. And he knew of great ships. And there were great ships in the first century that sailed the Mediterranean. When Paul was shipwrecked, there were 276 passengers shipwrecked. There were sailing boats that took a thousand people in the first century. 
what enabled them to move across the Mediterranean Sea and its waters in the midst of the winds? It was a little fellow sitting in the back of the, that was moving a piece of wood that was connected to the rudder. And as the rudder moved, so did the whole ship with, with its 300 or even 1,000 on board. This little bit of flesh between the jaws, as Martin, Martin Luther liked to call the tongue, this little bit of fe- flesh between the jaws is like the rudder of a great ship. Mastery of it is mastery of the whole person. And the reason it becomes this instrument is the reporter of what's in my heart. It's a great thing, isn't it, to ask yourself by way of self-examination. Somebody passes me and w- with an aftershave that I've never smelt before or a perfume that I've never known existed. And they leave the aroma. And as they leave, the aroma lingers in the air as a kind of afterpresence of that person. What lingers in the air when you and I leave a room? What aroma do people say how that scent reminds me of Christ? Or is James going on to say in these words, like salt water that tastes bitter and just leaves me thirsty? So he wants to emphasize first of all the disproportionate power of the tongue in verse 3 and 4. And then in the verses that follow, from verse 5 through verse 8, he emphasizes a second thing. The devastation that can be caused by the tongue. And you see, either that this man had a very quick mind, or he had just preached a whole series of sermons on the subject of the tongue, because there just now comes from this whole series of images that vividly describe the devastation that, be, that can be caused by the tongue. He says it's like a spark that causes a forest fire in verse 5 and 6. He says in verse 6, it's a whole world. I once was... I once was in one of these quizzes, you know, that you sometimes see in in-flight magazines. I saw a photograph, and the question was, what is this? I was sure it was the moon. It had craters and crags, mountains, and it looked dark and sinister. And I turned to page 153 or wherever. It was a picture of the tongue, such a vivid illustration of what James is saying here. Your tongue is a conduit to a whole universe. In your soul, and yes, sadly, he says, verse 6, the tongue can be like a stain. And if you, and if just as you were coming out this morning, having a last gulp of coffee to wake yourself up, and oops, onto that carefully pressed white shirt, or your new dress, and whatever your husband said to you, you said to him, you can't possibly go to church dressed like that. You've spoiled the whole thing. And it's true, isn't it? It's true that this little instrument that has no bone, but can mud a reputation, can stain my whole life. I can be superbly intelligent. I can have an outstanding profession. I can have great success, and yet this little instrument can stain the whole, can stain the whole and make me so unlike the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says very vigorously in verse 7 and 8, it's really like an untamed beast. Every animal or beast, he says, you can tame it. They could tame beasts in the ancient world, you know. It's not just in sea world they can do these things. They could tame beasts. You see, some of these great athletes who have tamed their physique can do extraordinary things. And when you hear what comes out of their mouth, you think, oh, James was right. Nobody has ever been able to tame the tongue. It is, verse 8, a restless evil and a deadly poison. Now that's an interesting description, isn't it? Some of us have restless tongues. Some of us have restless tongues, don't we? And we, and really, James is saying that is actually a sign of a restless heart. It is a sign of a restless heart. It's a sign that we haven't really rested in Jesus, who said, "Come unto me, and I will give you rest." You see, now of course, some of us are more that way by nature and and by upbringing, by disposition, by idiosyncrasies of our personality. And some of us are the very reverse. Some of us have not resting hearts. Some of us have got stuck hearts and stuck tongues. That's not just what he's speaking about. He's speaking about the restlessness of my tongue that expresses the restlessness of a heart that has never really found rest in Jesus Christ. And therefore, it's not surprising that sometimes I'm like one of those snakes with a little sack of poison under my tongue. And just occasionally, I'll bite and that poison seeps out and I can't get it back. And the words go everywhere. 
Is it gossip it's, he's talking about? Is it slander he's talking about? Is it, as Paul says in Philippians 2, just murmuring and complaining he's talking about? Do everything without murmuring and complaining, he says to the Christians. Do you and I do that? We go home, especially if we're parents, and the words that come out, we complain, we moan, we groan, un- we groan usually about incidentals in the life of the church, at least so it's been in the history of the Christian church. And it's poison, really. It poisons everyone it touches. Our children drink in the poison. And if they have the same dis- and they have the same disposition, here's a mastery of the tongue in the life of the Christian fellowship. I am committed, and by God's grace, never will murmur and grumble. Now, my dear friends, if you and I say, it is right to do that because things have gone wrong. It's not against the church to which we belong. And that we're grumbling, it's not against the church to which we belong, and that we're grumbling any longer. It's against the Lord Jesus, who loved the church and gave himself for the church, and rather than grumble about the church, he weeps for the church. Then there is a third thing. There is a disproportionate power of the tongue. There is the devastation caused by the tongue, and oh, may God help us. There is the tragic inconsistency of the tongue. One minute we're praising him. I wonder if this will happen to any of us as we drive home. Somebody will cut in on us, and these lips that praised him will blast the image of Highway 2. How dare you? Do you know I have never in my life, thankfully, I have never preached on the subject of the tongue when I thought this is a sound that the congregation needs to hear. I've never, ever done that, nor am I doing it now. But this is a word that breaks right through us from James, doesn't it? If this this doesn't wound me, what is going to wound me? On one of four occasions, I believe, I've ever in my life preached from James' teaching on the tongue. I was in seminary. It was in the seminary where I used to teach. Somewhere in the 1980s, I preached a blistering sermon on the subject of the tongue went back to my office and phoned the mortgage company who were making such a mess of the arrangements for my refinancing of my mortgage, chewed out whoever was on the other end of the phone and put the phone down and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You've done that, haven't you? One of my close friends from my teenage years became a missionary in South Korea. He had a leather briefcase, satchel, that he prized very much. It was broken. He heard there was a little shop where they could mend his satchel. It was an hour away on the bus. He took his little satchel for an hour on the bus. He went to the shop and said, Can you repair it? Oh, yes, sir, we can repair it. When can you repair it? Next Tuesday, sir. We will repair it next Tuesday. Are you sure? I've spent an hour on the bus to get here. Will it be ready next Tuesday? Yes, it will be ready next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, on the bus, the long journey through the crazed streets of South Korea, where the people drive in frenetic ways, And he gets to the shop and says, you have my, and could see in their faces they did not have this. Oh, we are so sorry, sir. We quite forgot. He really developed fluency in Korea that day. They took him into the back room. They sat him down. They gave him a cup of tea, ginseng tea. And they said to him, what are you doing in South Korea? Where he was a missionary of Jesus Christ? What are you doing? And he felt the stain of the tragic inconsistencies The words from the old movies my mom and dad used to take me to on Friday nights. John Wayne, the Cowboys and the Indians, great days. White man speaks with forked tongues. And so, alas, ourselves, as you see James has already taught us, why it is so inconsistent. Remember how he'd said in chapter 1, verse 18, he said, don't you realize you've been born again by God's grace? And you're the first fruits of a new creation. And so you speak differently from other people. You have different treasures of which to speak in Jesus Christ. And you are indwelt by the Lord Jesus Christ, who will enable you to speak as you rest in him and find his grace. How are you to do this? Oh, my friends, I wish I had another half an hour this morning to take you into practical details about how we can do this. But here's one way. Do you remember the poems in the second half of the prophecy of Isaiah that are speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ? There's one in Isaiah 50, 4 verse 9, 
where we hear, as it were, in advance, Jesus speaking to his Father, and he says this, Morning by morning, you awaken my ear. You awaken, and my ear is open to listen to you. And that is why I've instructed, I have an instructed tongue that is able to bring the word of grace and mercy, or the word of reproof and correction, just at the right time, just in the right place, just to the right person. That's why you and I need, that's, why, that's one of the reasons we place ourselves under the ministry of the word of God and pray that the Holy Spirit will really plant it deep into our souls because no man can master his tongue. But God's word can break into our lives and not only press out of our lives the poison of our heart, but then to fill us with the most amazing resources that enable us to speak for Jesus Christ so that more and more in our lives, people will say to us, you know, six weeks ago, two years ago, nine years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you said just the right thing, just at the right time. You and I can't do that unaided. I certainly can't. My life is a litany of misspoken words. There are times when I walk down that center aisle and I say to the Lord, O oh Lord, can the center aisle not just swallow me up because I have not spoken as well as you, as you've called me to speak of you? We're all like this. That's why we need our mouths shut. As Paul says, our ears open, our hearts soften, and our wills bowed, and God's words. God's words, empowered by God's Spirit, will bring mastery of the tongue. Oh, my dear friends, that will mean that throughout this city, people will begin to say, you remind me of somebody. I'm not sure who it is, but the person of whom you remind them will be the Lord Jesus. One more minute. The reason this may be true of me, that my tongue is uncontrollable, is because I've never had my mouth shut before God. But the gospel shuts my mouth, and before him I've got nothing to say expect, except to bow my head and to cover my face and say with Isaiah, who happened to be the most eloquent preacher in Jerusalem, if not in the whole world. I'm a man of unclean lips. And when you thus can felt your guilt, confess your guilt, your sin, your need that comes to expression in your lips, he brings something from the altar of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, promises to cleanse your lips, to use your lips for his glory. And, and as you trust in your Savior, let's speak as well as him as we ever can. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning at the close of this worship service. We give you thanks for, for the words of, um, of James, Lord, and, and the words as we could hear here, Lord. We um, ask that, um, that we may um, look to you to, to tame our tongues, Lord, that, that um, as our tongue can, can act like a, a sharp-edged sword, as it can speak so, so compassionately and so graciously and, and speak for you, Lord, that it can also speak the other way, Lord, that, um, that it can bring people down, that it can, can make people think, um, yeah, why? Lord, we ask that um, we may always look to you, to, Lord, to, to guard our tongues, to, to direct it in the right way, Lord. We ask in, in all that we heard today that, um, that we may take it to heart and that, um, that we may, yeah, become more and more like you and that we may be servants of, of your Son, Lord, and that um, we may be able to work this out in your Son, Jesus, our Savior. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen.